the percentage votes given at the referendum was as follows. Yes, 71.12%. Yeah! There had been several efforts to negotiate an end to the conflict. They had all failed. In simple terms, if you're trying to end a war, you have to include in the negotiations the people who are fighting the war. That had not been the case before that. The possibility of breakdown was just there, like this dark shadow beside us at all points. This is an amazingly difficult step that we're taking. I wanted him to do something that would make a positive difference. Trust was in short supply, really. We viewed them as outright combatants who would probably murder us if things didn't work out the way they wanted to. I wouldn't touch it with a 40 foot pole. How can you not sign an agreement? We need the peace. Those people lived through their troubles, had to go back to the communities, sell the agreement. I mean, it was, it was huge. Decommissioning came into focus. Prisoner releases caused more and more unease. It was drama of the highest, pure political theater. More than 400 angry loyalists broke through the main grounds of the Stormont estate and made their way to the parliament buildings. I feel the hand of history upon our shoulder. I really do. If we can create a situation where the border is less important, we can push that into the future and get on with building the present. Our priority was to secure that future within the United Kingdom. The Good Friday Agreement was never a settlement. It's an agreement on a journey without agreement on the destination. just before six this evening to inaugurate the historic agreement they hope will usher in a new era for the island. There was praise for the Taoiseach and for the parties from Tony Blair, who paid tribute to all who had lost their lives in the conflict, suggesting that the nature of today's deal would change relationships in Northern Ireland forever. The principle of consent is absolute and is throughout the agreement. And the breakthrough is that that is now accepted by all, North and South. We would regard it as a very, very welcome beginning uh, in which we would be leaving the past behind us and building the new future together. The atmosphere in that summer after the 94 ceasefire was uh, particularly euphoric. It was a real sense that peace had come at last. But behind the scenes, trouble was, was brewing, I think, uh, or, or was continuing to brew over the decommissioning issue. What we want to see is a complete and permanent end to violence. And we want to see that accompanied by a disarmament of all the terrorist groups. Our success at the ballot box, Mr. Major, has confirmed our right to be inside, not outside, these talks. The talks really had been bogged down in the question of whether the IRA ceasefire was permanent or not. Ultimately, the, the IRA ran out of patience, and I remember it vividly. I was driving down the Lisburn Road in Belfast, and I rang my colleague in London, Brian O'Connell, to talk things through, uh, our London editor. And halfway through the conversation, he said, there's been a very big bang from down the river. That was the Canary Wharf bomb. Tonight's explosion in London happened in an underground car park of a six-storey building in the East End Canary Wharf area. The IRA issued a statement to the RTE newsroom to say that instead of embracing the peace process, the British government acted in bad faith with John Major and the Unionist leadership squandering this unprecedented opportunity to resolve the conflict. Of course, like everybody else, we were devastated. I suppose I wasn't entirely surprised that the IRA had gone back to their campaign of violence. It must be said that the two governments were um, determined, nevertheless, to keep the talks process on the rails and to keep it and to make clear that it would be an inclusive talks process. There was something fundamentally different about this set of negotiations because it was built around the concept of three strands. The first covers the devolution of government from Westminster to the province. Strand two, the relations between Northern Ireland and the Republic. The third strand covers relations between the governments in London and Dublin. The prize in these successful talks is very substantial. 
I don't believe people want to continue as they have done for so long with all the difficulties that exist in, uh, in Northern Ireland. John Major named a date uh, for the beginning of uh, talks in June of 96. I remember Gusty Spence saying in, in June 1996 when the talks began that all we're missing now is the Shinners. And I said to him at the time, what do you mean? And he said, we need Sinn Féin locked into the democratic process. We need to see the whites of their eyes. So for 18 months, we had shenanigans around procedures and processes. Come on inside and get warm. George Mitchell had both resigned his position in the Senate and as Senate Majority Leader and made it clear that he did not want to accept an appointment to the Supreme Court. But the fact that I wanted to put him on the Supreme Court is evidence of how much I thought of him. And I thought he would be perfect because, first, he was an expert negotiator in impossible situations. Whatever came along, he could be trusted. It was a very difficult process with little progress for a year and a half. The sessions were disorderly, a lot of yelling, a lot of shouting, a lot of interrupting, a lot of not wanting to listen to the other person. And I'd really never encountered anything like this. Okay. We had uh, quite a period of um, talking in circles, we felt a lot of time we weren't getting very far. Uh, looking back, I think that's because there was a conservative government, there was a minority government, they needed unionism. And uh, that changed almost like a switch um, when uh, the Labour Party came in. This new Labour government will govern in the interests of all our people, the whole of this nation. That I can promise. When I first uh, went to Belfast, I had the opportunity to meet a number of women who felt uh, that women had a big role to play. They were active in um, the trade union movement, in academia, in journalism, even business, but they hadn't played a role in politics. And I think they decided the time had come for them to be uh, actors in helping to uh, end the troubles and create a different future for Northern Ireland. There was certainly a sense from 97 on that we were getting down to more of the real business. Mo Molum's celebrated informality was much in evidence as she arrived in Belfast with a boisterous media scrum that awaited her. We knew Mo Molum. We had worked with Mo. Um, she had been part of the trade union movement for really all of her working life. We had also worked with her in a very significant way on the women's rights agenda. We wanted to see fairly fundamental commitments to equality in a deeply unequal society. The ball is in the IRA's court. All I can do is bring people together. And then, of course, Tony Blair and, and Bertie Ahern came in to put some power behind the negotiations. Thanks very much. Well, 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 what do you plan to do about the whole peace process? Well, it's, it's, it will be a, our number one priority, I think, in the, in the early days of, of the life of this government, and uh, we're looking forward to getting on and working on that. You have, uh, I call them the 40-somethings, Tony Blair, the 40-something new Prime Minister in London. You had Bertie Hearn, the 40-something new Taoiseach in Dublin, and you had Bill Clinton, the 40-something President of the United States. All three, you know, people in their prime, people with no baggage historically, um, and, but people with a real sense of mission and determination. The ceasefire was over, fighting was going on, uh, the situation was pretty grim. It looked quite hard to resuscitate the peace process once we came to power. I hope and trust uh, that the response from the IRA will be positive, uh, that we will be able to get back into a position uh, of a ceasefire situation. The advent of Bertie was crucial to us. And when he came in, a partnership was built that really was crucial to making peace in Northern Ireland. We both said that if, if we were elected, that we would give this a real shot. And as soon as Tony was elected, I mean, the plan was that he would go to Belfast to placate unionists because the Labour Party had traditionally taken a fairly you know, pro-Republican line. None of us in this hall today, even perhaps the youngest, is likely to see Northern Ireland 
as anything but a part of the United Kingdom. That is the reality because the consent principle is now almost universally accepted. My message to Sinn Féin is clear. The settlement train is leaving. I want you on that train, but it is leaving anyway, and I will not allow it to wait for you. There was a complete breath of fresh air where he said, basically, look, I'm a unionist, but I also want to see a political settlement in Northern Ireland that has all sides bought into it. So Trimble uh, and the rest of us in the Ulster Unionist Party at that time responded very, very positively to that because we thought that was a really good starting point for us at that time. I had again started having private meetings with Jerry Adams. The en entire effort was that we would try and fairly quickly um, get the ceasefire up and running. We'd never been in the negotiations in the, the public sense. All of our negotiations were private. Dealing with the British government through a back channel which had been established. We got a very positive response from one of our contacts who spoke directly to Blair, that he was resolute and committed to, to trying to do something, to try and make progress. We had already been back channeling with Sinn Féin that year because they hadn't been at the peace talks and we had been trying to convince them that these were the only, was the only game in town. Two governments for the first time in history. All of the parties to the problem becoming parties to the solution. And that message um, had to be carried through their own ranks. Today is the start of a new stage of the peace process. I very much welcome uh, this statement. And I cannot believe that if Sinn Féin says that they want a, a ceasefire, uh, that the IRA won't respond, because they are, after all, simply part of the, of the one organization and movement. That was a very difficult uh, period uh, and, and difficult decisions that had to be made. We were concerned that there was the potential, given the second IRA ceasefire uh, and the admission of Sinn Féin into the talks by the Labour government, that that new government under Tony Blair were determined to do some kind of deal uh, with Sinn Féin. And therefore, unionism needed to be at the table to ensure the unionist voice was heard and that we would have an influence and a say in the kind of agreement that might be shaped. So the ball was very much in our court and we had a decision to take. Of course, the DUP and the UK unionists are saying, well, look, if these guys are gonna be let into the talks, there's been no IRA decommissioning, uh, we're out of here. Ultimately, the, the problem is you've got to, to have something where you're taking steps along the way, and as each step is taken, then you build greater trust. You're dealing with deep legacies of mistrust. So that's the only, it's only through a process you're ever gonna get an, an agreement. And, and that was the reality. When the talks began just over a year ago, Republicans were on the outside looking in. Is somebody in charge? It now appears they will be allowed into castle buildings on September the 15th. The question is, will any unionists be there to talk to them? Nearly all of our supporters couldn't distinguish between Sinn Féin and the IRA. They were interchangeable. Uh, many of our members had been killed. Uh, other councillors were attacked. So this was something that was very, very, very difficult. There was a lot of nervousness. Um, initially, um, I remember people asking me or saying to me that Sinn Féin shouldn't be allowed into the talks and they shouldn't be part of the talks, but I was always of the opinion from a very young age that we needed all those involved in the conflict to sit down together to try and resolve it. And certainly that was coming from the leadership of the, the PUP. We won't be begrudging about the, the time that was lost other than to be deeply disappointed about the begrudgers who cost us so much time. I'm not going to sit down with bloodthirsty monsters who have been killing and terrorizing my people. There's no doubt that the UK Unionist Party and the DUP were trying to sabotage the process at an early stage. Our concerns were not about whether the IRA had guns. It was whether they were going to use them. 
if we are if we are agreeing to this, if we're agreeing to uh, whatever we agree to, that this is for good, that this is that this is a commitment that there will not be a return to conflict. Uh, that's what we wanted to hear from republicanism. You have the famous footage of the Ulster Unionist Party and the two Loyalist parties walking into the talks together. That was probably one of the first times that David Trimble really showed really good leadership. And two, that the, the Loyalist parties stuck by him. Because if um, David Trimble had decided at that time that the pressure was too great, he walked out too, well, you know, the, 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 the talks would have been pretty short. <laughs> When they did that, I turned around and said to the women in the coalition, this is it, the game's on. There's only one way forward now, and that's to make a deal. Senator George Mitchell led his team out to meet the media in good spirits. It had been, he said, a significant day in the talks process. The serious negotiation has begun. I believe there's a determination to go forward. Well, that day is, is uh, really ingrained in my memory. Um, it's one I'll never forget. Here I was, sat across a room from Jerry Adams and Martin McGuinness and their negotiating team. And in truth, I'd never had any real or significant engagement with anyone from Sinn Féin up to that point. Um, and that was a difficult moment. I suppose it was new ground for everybody. Uh, when you put people into a room or put people into any space, it, it's very difficult for them to ignore each other. And e even just the, the, the fact of being together in the same place, to get used to each other. I mean, I can remember the first, the first day we, we went into the talks, you were bringing effectively these people into a process and we viewed them as outright combatants and who still would probably murder us if things didn't work out the way they wanted to. That may seem quite extreme to listen to 25 years later. That's exactly how we felt at that time. It took a very long time to establish trust, to get the parties to actually talk with each other. I said on the first day, uh, I know that uh, you have a whole, a long history of talking and walking out and not listening to the other. Uh, but I want to assure you, whatever you want to say and whenever you want to say it, I will listen. And I framed it in a way, first, that it would be their agreement. On the very first day of the negotiations, I said to all the delegates, if there is ever to be an agreement, it has to be yours. Before we broke for Christmas of that year, we, the chairman, prepared a single-page document which listed the major questions to be addressed and answered if the negotiations were to succeed. At first, the meeting went quite well. And then suddenly, almost inexplicably, it turned. And you're lying to the people of Ulster, but your lies have been caught on. And it ended in a shambles. We couldn't even agree on what the issues were that they had to resolve after a year and a half of discussions. That was, to me, I thought, uh, the well of despair. I remember being very frustrated almost at the point of tears at the time because I felt this really was going to be a problem if we were going to break up for Christmas in uh, these terms. And I was taking seriously the sort of warnings that were coming uh, from David Irvine and others about what the mood would be in loyalism if the talks were just seen uh, to drift and not be going anywhere at that stage. We probably made a mistake. Um, we broke a bit early for Christmas. Of course, what happened then was that, you know, as soon as you have a vacuum, it equals trouble. Among Republicans, Billy Wright from Portadown was the most feared loyalist paramilitary in Northern Ireland. This morning, he was shot dead at the maze while on the way to a prison visit from his girlfriend. 
the gunman crawled over the roof of H Block 6 and jumped into the LVF exercise yard and shot Billy Wright up to five times in the back. I always remember Stevens this day and, and, and Billy Wright we shot in the prisons. Then the UDP, some of their guys shot people. Um, then some Republicans shot people. This marks a new low in this process. Life has been seen to be assessed by government as very cheap. January, you know, I had crisis meetings with David Trimble. I spent hours on a, a Sunday night, I remember, in government buildings with David Trimble. One to one, we got on, started getting on really well at that stage. You know, he, he gave out to me, shouted at me, but then we'd be good friends. So, you know, that was the, the way it was. The talks had moved to London for three days of intensive discussions, but as the parties arrived this morning, that had all gone by the board. In London, uh, the government's decided to expel one of the loyalist parties from the talks. We need to see the British government, our government, standing up on its own two feet, not being driven by the Irish government, but being seen... They the were headed the by then a young man, Gary McMichael, uh, a, a terrific guy who I came to like and admire and count as a friend. But I said to them, this is not a permanent expulsion. You know, it didn't do anything good for the process. I had been involved in the talks process at that stage for a year and a half. And you had a, a background of where there had been sporadic instability and violence. So it was, you know, there was, there was never a smooth path. There was never a stage within it by which it was smooth. You know, at, at every stage, it looked like people were going to walk away. Lifelong close friends, Damien Trainer, a Catholic, and Philip Allen, a Protestant, were fatally injured. The dead men were inseparable friends. I condemn unreservedly those responsible for this atrocity. I'm ashamed to think that the perpetrators were Protestants, as it appears to be the case. We all in the political sphere should be inspired by the example of this little village. Two very quiet guys, both of them that night sitting drinking orange juice. The chat was at the time that Philip was talking to Damien about he was getting married. Damien maybe would be his best man. One was a Catholic, one was a Protestant, which means absolutely nothing around here because it was a very, very mixed community. Two LVF gunmen came in. The two guys, Philip and Damien, were sitting just here. I told them to get down onto the floor, so they put those two guys on the floor and uh, put, shot, put five shots, four into one of the guys, one into the other. It was complete disbelief, you know, nothing that ever happened here in the Troubles. It was just a lovely wee community to live in and, you know, for that to come in <coughs> was a huge thing in the, in the area. People just didn't know how to respond to it. Seamus Mallon had came to the Allen Wake and next thing then, David Trimble walked in. And Seamus says to David, uh, once we're finished here, why don't the two of us walk up the street and go over to the other one together? Just to show a united front that we're together on this, no matter what side of the religion you're on, this is completely wrong. So the two guys walked up the street, became a very symbolic moment, as the Good Friday Agreement was being talked about at the time, and they walked up the street and it was great to see it. I can remember round the table that day, from every party, people, demonstrating a real resolve that violence like that wasn't going to be seen to have the upper hand uh, over the sort of dialogue we were trying to be involved in. And I can remember saying that day that the stories we were hearing on the radio about uh, their friendship uh, could be a parable for the sort of society that we could create if we got an agreement. So there was real determination that day uh, been voiced by the parties, even though we were still in disagreement about different things or whatever, but there was uh, a determination there that we couldn't just uh, let these talks drift into uh, failure. When I subsequently that day saw the pictures on TV of Seamus Mallon and David Trumbull together in Points Pass, it registered in my mind as you can have a leader of nationalism and a leader of unionism, almost literally binding the wounds of the community. That turned into the idea of a joint office of First Ministers. 
I always felt they came back from that, uh, that tragedy, totally, totally united and at one. Spiritually, ideologically, they were going to do something with the process. They were going to work as hard as they could to get some kind of a political breakthrough to stop these sorts of things happening. Because we just lived with this all our lives. We'd lived with this for years and years and years. It had to stop. That was the seesaw. You know, one time it looked as if we were going to get an agreement, then suddenly it looked as if we weren't going to get an agreement. George Mitchell played such an important role in, in clearing the ground. I got on a plane and I flew back to the United States. And so I, I uh, pulled out a pad, yellow legal pad on the plane, and I wrote out a plan for two weeks of final intensive negotiations with an absolute hard deadline. It was George Mitchell's decision to call us all together for yet another plenary in, in sometime in around the 20th of March, I think. It went something like this. I've been with you now for three years or so. It's been a, a, a remarkable experience for me personally. I have listened to your stories. They have been fascinating. I am sure that there are many more. Uh, but in the meantime, a son has been born to me in New York, and I would like to see him before he goes to college. So I am declaring that the time has come for us to bring our discussions to a close and reach decisions. So I am setting a deadline for these talks for Thursday, the 9th of April. There's a growing feeling that the real negotiations will go right down to the wire, with the crunch coming as Easter approaches. And it's noticeable that those talks optimists are growing more cautious in their predictions. The mood fluctuated wildly uh, during that last week of talks. Um, it started badly when the two governments presented a joint paper to George Mitchell to be the basis for discussion with the parties. George Mitchell said subsequently it was unsaleable to unionists. It was so green. After an initial look at it, David Trimble had a stormy meeting with the chairman, followed by a number of phone calls to Tony Blair to warn him that the unionists couldn't accept the document's contents. When I saw the document that the prime ministers had agreed on for the first time on that Sunday evening, I knew instantly that it was unacceptable to the unionists. I was certain of it. I'll never forget the meeting. David threw this whole pile of papers down and he said to me, this is unacceptable. I said, I know that. He said, you have to tell the Irish government that it has to be renegotiated. I said, I already have. We're horrified by it. The section on the north-south all-island dimension is just ridiculously excessive. The communication went back to the Irish to say, guys, this, this isn't going to work. There's no way we're accepting this. And their immediate reaction was, well, that's our position and we're not changing. I knew it wasn't going to fly. Now, this is where Bertie Ahern and the Irish government were extremely important in this whole affair because they, uh, once it was explained that this was just not going to work, they had the flexibility not to insist, but to say, okay, well, let's, let's work with what's, what's going to be possible. Trimble had told Blair earlier on the Tuesday morning, this is going down the toilet. You better get over here to rescue this because if you don't, I just think it's going to collapse. Clearly, this paper is unacceptable to the Ulster Unionists. I personally could not be identified with it. It creates many difficulties. Outside, John Taylor's leaving to go to an event in London. And I think Eamon Malley asks him the question, what do you think of the paper or the document? And Taylor comes out with the infamous... I wouldn't touch it with a 40-foot pole. So it was all a bit of theatrics, I suppose, at that point in time. On Sunday, I spoke to Mr. Blair on the telephone and told him he needed to come. 
Today, it's Tuesday. And if the Prime Minister wants a deal, he better get here fast. By the time I actually got to Belfast, you know, just before the Good Friday in 1998, I mean, I... It was in complete disarray. I mean, frankly, it was, it was, it had broken down. When I, I got there, George Mitchell said to me, I, I just don't think this is going to come together. You know, I'd learned from my old time as a lawyer when I'd done negotiations. It comes a point in time when you, you've got to grip it yourself. You can't leave it to other people. You've got to get across all the detail, go right into it. And that's when Tony did his famous, you know, this is not a day for sound bites, but I, f I feel the hand fist chip on the shoulder, I really do. <laughs> and I remember Jonathan Powell like, what, what's that about? And he, the, people think that was all planned, it wasn't, it was like... I feel the hand of history upon our shoulder, in respect of this. I really do. And I just think we need to acknowledge that and respond to it. Now, maybe it's impossible to find a way through. Maybe even with the best faith in the world, you can't do it. But it's right to try. I think, I think the, the hand of history phrase is it came into my head literally because I thought, well, this is it. This is a moment of history. You, you either do it or you don't do it. And so in a way, it really did express what I, what I, I felt. And I also realized I had in, in Bertie Ahern and in the Irish government, people who were clever, you know, I, and who were more interested in the outcome than the politics. We will stay at it, we'll work at it, and we will have the determination, the confidence, and the commitment that will bring this thing through, I hope, by tonight or tomorrow morning. I felt that it was close to going belly up that I went out and addressed the press, that there's still time to negotiate in the next number of days. So let's get our heads around this and get it sorted. And I think everyone now knows that it was Bertie Ahern that did the heavy lifting. It was incredible what he was carrying in terms of a burden, personally and politically. There was sombre news overnight, the death of the Taoiseach's mother. All sides expressed their condolences. We should all have some sense of how difficult that must be to handle at this time. It was suggested that I talk to George Mitchell. I came out of the church in Marino, uh, Griffith Avenue, quite near, near to my home. So I rang George Mitchell, and he was on to me to, to say, listen, there was a real danger, the unions were going to walk out. The only way of dealing with this was for me to, to go to, to Belfast the following morning. I was sitting with the constitutional position, uh, and, and I, before I left Dublin, made it absolutely clear there'd be no change in the constitution unless there was an North South Ministerial Council. Here he was making a decision critical to his country's future. And uh, he was also attending and participating in the funeral of his beloved mother. It was a very, very tough time for him. I had, I thought, some glimmer that if we were prepared to move substantially, and I, 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 I knew from the Irish government that they were prepared to move substantially, that we could open up a a fresh negotiation. So I, it was difficult because we were effectively kind of starting, starting again in negotiating the three strands, but no one really wanted to walk away from that. And when no one wants to walk away, then you've always got a chance of, of getting an agreement. Here now in Castle Buildings are very difficult discussions because what is coming is going to be a compromise and what's coming is going to require hard decisions. We have a mammoth task in front of all the politicians here today. I, I find it almost impossible to imagine that they can resolve all the outstanding issues by midnight. We were aiming, and I know Mitchell was aiming for a deadline on Thursday the 9th, and was keeping people there to midnight and beyond in order to agree the document. It was like a roller coaster of a ride. I remember pacing the corridors. You're picking up from various parties and from governments. Things are going well or things are going badly. You make some progress, 
you take two steps back. So everything was always on a knife edge. Time is something the parties have only five and a half hours of if they're to meet their deadline. People were agitated, they were worried. It was very hard not to allow your heart to rule your head. And we were saying to ourselves, what is going to happen to our children if we lose this? What is going to happen? I'm not optimistic, I'm not pessimistic, I'm hopeful. During the day, Tony Blair held more meetings with the T-shirt. Who, on returning to Stormont, had also expressed some optimism following last night's discussions with the Ulster Unionists. I believe that people are determined. I, I think they all assured me last night that they're prepared to make the necessary moves that can put this all in place, and hopefully they are. I'll tell you tonight, what I was determined to do and there would have been no agreement if I didn't because the SCLP would have walked um, was that there was going to be a north-south ministerial council that dealt with the issues that were relevant uh, on this island and that allowed uh, the SCLP and the Unionist Party to deal uh, on strand one so strand one when, when I moved on strand two uh, they moved on strand, strand one the parties were really under a lot of pressure. And I remember Bill Clinton actually phoning all of the party leaders, talking to all of the party leaders, encouraging them to get the job done, encouraging them to, to, to go ahead. We knew we were coming to the 11th hour, and I was on the phone until 2.30, walking through all the details. So I get off the phone, and I went to bed again, and I slept, I don't know, maybe two hours outside. And at 5 o'clock in the morning, George called me again. He said, I just need you to make a couple more calls. And, uh, and he said, don't you complain. He said, you got me into this part-time job. What we're here today doing is to uh, finally, I hope, reach agreement. The, the most memorable thing for me was that Seamus Mallon and John Hume came in kind of tearful, emotional, because they had agreed, they'd signed off on Strand One, uh, which was basically to share power. Um, they had reached agreement with, with uh, the unionists that this is how it's going to be, Strand and with the British government, that there's going to be a power-sharing executive for the first time. David Trimble and party colleagues left Stormont an hour ago to brief the UUP's executive. They went not with a final agreement in their hands, but to tell the party faithful what could be on the table. We had an executive meeting on, at half six, I think, on the, on the Thursday. He told them we'd, we'd hit all our objectives, we'd, we'd got everything, consent, strand one, two and three. We'd, we were on course to get the Irish Articles 2 and 3 territorial claim removed. All of those things that we desperately wanted to secure, we'd got them. I mean, who would have ever have thought that the Republic would have given up Articles 2 and 3? Now, I would argue they should never have been there in the first place, but that was the 1937 De Valera Constitution. As David Trimble, leader of the Unionists, left his party headquarters tonight, he was heckled by other Unionists saying he's selling out. Constantly under pressure. There was poisonous exchanges. He didn't have the support even of some of his own party. That left David in a very exposed position. I don't underestimate the pressures on David Trimble at all. I think sometimes that David had to kind of take quite a lot of grief publicly in front of us and in front of everybody else. Um, and so yeah, the pressures were, the pressures on him were, were, were real and intense. We went back to the talks on the Thursday night and the talks went on and on and on into the night, and they went on all night. Unbeknown to us, there was a parallel process that had been taking place with the UK government and the Irish government with Sinn Féin. Uh, Sinn Féin's focus was on release of prisoners and the decommissioning of weapons. The issue in the prisoners was between a meeting with Tony Blair, um, Martin McGuinness, Jerry Adams and myself between two a.m. and 6 a.m. And I think it was understood by everybody that if there wasn't a resolution on the prisoner's issue, um, that you weren't going to be able to carry the day. 
To be perfectly honest, we hadn't really thought much about prisoners uh, before that stage. It, it kind of, I mean, I don't quite know why we didn't, but we hadn't really thought about it. It was a bit of a shock. I mean, we hadn't, we didn't think, how are we going to sell this to the British public? Yeah, basically, it's an amnesty because you let people out after two years. The prisoner issue had to be settled. There had to be a, a time put on it. And the, the governments had agreed to an accelerated process. They had set an accelerated process, but hadn't put a time on it. And, and we, needed a, we needed a time. We were arguing for a year, but we would settle for two. We eventually uh, dealt directly with Blair on it. He said three. We remained in castle buildings overnight. Uh, and at uh, some stage early in the morning, I remember going out for a walk with one of my colleagues just to stretch our legs. And just to the right-hand side of that main entrance on the first floor were the Sinn Féin offices. And obviously they were lit up, it was dark, but the, the blinds were open. Uh, you could see pa uh, bags being packed, papers being uh, put into boxes. And I could see clearly that uh, Sinn Féin were preparing uh, to uh, leave. We in Sinn Féin want an agreement. But as I speak to you now, there is no agreement. More than 400 angry loyalists broke through the main grounds of the storm into state and made their way to the parliament buildings. Essentially, David Trimble had the toughest task, in, in, in my view, because he had a powerful section of unionism standing outside of any process and, and accusing him of betrayal. And, you know, he had difficult issues to deal with. This is a press conference, and you just, you're not press men. You belong to parties that are opposed to my party. Well, just shut up. Just shut up. Yeah. Yeah. I was inside of the talks, um, and I was watching all this unfold. Paisley started to, to give his press conference. They started to shout at him that he was a dinosaur, that he was yesterday's man. You, you have your own press conference with your buddy, Jerry Adams. Have it, and you'll be very welcome to it. Uh, let me, let me say... The enmity between the PUP and the UDP and Paisley uh, was palpable. I mean, these are people who, uh, as they saw it, had kind of died in the trenches uh, for Paisleyism. So when we saw him on that night, we, it was almost as if, again, it was another watershed moment. We felt, well, this, this is the end, the beginning of the end of Ian Paisley. I went up to discuss the release of uh, prisoners with Mo Molum. It became obvious fairly quickly at the meeting that the people she had in the room, I think, was the director of prisons. There was a number of... Uh, they were all connected to prisons. I said, if you don't mind me saying, and I'm not saying this to be ignorant to anybody, uh, but you have the wrong people in the room. I went down to the core negotiating group and I was briefing them on how, how it went when the door opened and Mo Molum came in. She said to me, when, when do you need them released? And I says, immediately. She says, I can't do it. And my memory is I said to her, one year. Jerry had said to me, go down and see if you can get a private yarn with uh, Gary McMichael and uh, Davy Irvine. The PUP members were divided across a couple of rooms, shuttling back and forwards to get parties' opinions and things. And so this, this went on throughout the night. I remember at one stage Jerry Kelly coming to the door of the PUP office and everybody sort of held their breath. You know, um, Bomber Kelly is at the door, you know, what's this about? And he called David out and it was exactly about prisoner releases and, and, and trying to get um, the loyalist parties, if you like, to agree to a one-year time frame for prisoner releases. And David said, absolutely no way, you know. We have to be mindful of, of this society and the community and what's acceptable out there. And I, he thought that uh, one year was, was too soon. Well, I mean, the upshot of that was we, we kept pushing and we ended up getting uh, an agreement on uh, all releases within two years. Sinn Féin were pulling a stunt, threatening to walk away in order to put pressure, particularly on Tony Blair. And I think it was at that moment that Tony Blair made major concessions to Sinn Féin. There had always been a discussion in any peace process that there would be some form of amnesty for people who committed acts of terrorism. So a prisoner release was always going to be part of it. 
And I'm afraid in this instance, the advice I got was just wrong, which was <laughs> that, that unionism would, would accept this very easily. I mean, I, I confess, you know, that was very, very difficult, and it was always going to be difficult. By dawn on Good Friday morning, having most of us worked through the night, there was definitely a sense of light. There was a, an absolute feeling that, actually, do you know what? Unbelievably, we may actually have a deal in sight. It was, it was kind of rather extraordinary. It was, um, it was a feeling of euphoria. I mean, you're partly born out of complete exhaustion. You know, three nights of no sleep, you start hallucinating, and you're just so tired, and the relief you've got somewhere rather than it all being wasted. But really, we were keen just to get this thing pinned down before anyone else could open up questions. I came into the canteen along with David Irvine and members of the PUP. The announcement was just being made in the canteen that there was no more bacon rolls left, that there was only toast. I passed my colleagues the SDLP table who were eating their bacon rolls, and I said, it's Good Friday. Their faces dropped and the bacon rolls dropped. And David Irvine turned to his colleagues and says, typical, the takes can't have it themselves, but they take the bite out of it so the prods can't have any. I spent the morning talking with various party leaders, uh, answering questions. Almost all of them had some questions, reassuring them, uh, expressing hope. When the dominoes start falling, they fall fast. We had to work really hard on that Holy Thursday night. If you don't pay attention whilst you're coming towards a deal and it's not in the final deal, then don't come crying afterwards expecting it to be in. We were making a proposal for a Bill of Rights. We were making proposals around victims because we figured that maybe no one else would be doing that, that this section on reconciliation needed to have a section on victims and to address the needs of victims. It almost didn't make its way in. I'm not sure we really believed that it was going to happen, but we were hopeful because we had done a great deal of work behind the scenes. As Martin Luther King is often paraphrased, you know, peace isn't the absence of violence, it's the presence of justice. So the commitments on equality, the commitments on human rights, we were lobbying people, we were lobbying the political parties, saying, for God's sake, please, um, come to an agreement. We staggered out into the open, all of us exhausted from not having slept. It really did feel like, I'm sorry to use the cliche, but it felt like a new dawn. Seamus Mallon, when I asked him, how are you feeling, Seamus? He said, it's the happiest day of my life. And I, it was one of these things. Now, he may have been exaggerating somewhat, but nevertheless, he, he was a very happy man because he thought that the deal was done. Yes, I think we've just got to keep going and not waste a moment. I think the most important thing is just to make sure nothing goes wrong in the last... And then I'd been told by my staff that the LC unionists were engaged in a very difficult and controversial meeting. I thought it would, would have been prisoners, quite frankly. I, I, my, my, my guess was that the word would have come out to what Tony Blair was prepared to offer on prisoners and that that would have fed uh, into the room. But, uh, it was on the, on the decommission issue. These issues around decommissioning for the release of prisoners and this time, that was, that was really difficult. I mean, it was obvious you couldn't get an agreement without these things, but that was a very delicate dance all the way through. That was extremely difficult, and I think, um, you know, we almost lost it during that, that period. David had a huge problem with the, with the unionist delegation. Um, and it was all really around this issue to do with, 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 with whether the violence would really stop or whether, which was the unionist fear, they were going to be locked into an executive with the IRA still active. So I think the deliver justice is key here. Martin. With the full document to review at that point. And the truth is there was a lot of, a lot of studying of the document, a lot of reflection. Can we live with this? Can we live with that? But by late morning, it was very clear that Jeffrey wasn't happy. Ken McGuinness, he began with a sigh, shoulders dropped, and he just said, look, guys, I, I've, I've been at this now for 30 years, and I've seen it all. 
we've achieved the consent principle, we've, we've secured the return of Stormont, we've got north-south arrangements into a place that doesn't threaten unionism, the east-west relationships are good, we've articles two and three revoked. But I'm not happy about prisoner releases, I'm not happy about the policing stuff, I'm not happy about the language around decommissioning either. And David Trimble actually said, towards the end of the contributions of everybody, he said, well, look, if I go back to the Prime Minister with one issue, one issue alone, I'm not going to go back with a list of issues, we're too late for that. What's the one issue? The meeting was coming to a conclusion that they couldn't sign the agreement if they didn't get something stronger on, on decommissioning. And, um, you know, that was fed up to Tony. It, it, to Tony was, was very, very worried, and that was fed to George, and I, 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 I knew what was happening. That's when we panicked. Trimble came up and said, you know, you have to reopen this and negotiate on decommissioning to make it clear. And Tony said, I can't reopen it at this stage. If we do, we'll lose the whole thing. The anxieties of the unionist delegation weren't unreasonable. David was prepared to lead them, but he, he, he couldn't force them. And in any event, he personally felt this very strongly. Tony decided what we should do is do a side letter for David Trimble. And sat down and Tony dictated a letter to me. I typed it away. I pulled it off the printer and I rushed downstairs. And I couldn't get into the unionist room. They had the door locked. He banged the door down for four or five minutes. Um, he delivered the letter under the door. A letter uh, emerged which sought to give an assurance that uh, if uh, Sinn Féin didn't follow through in using their best efforts to secure IRA decommissioning, that, that the Prime Minister would act. The difficulty for me was that it was just a letter. It wasn't part of the agreement. It wasn't in the text of the agreement. Uh, and therefore, I felt it didn't change the agreement and therefore didn't alter the concerns or address adequately the concerns I had. We had to come to a view in that moment. And sometimes life's like this in politics and in business. Sometimes you just have to go with your gut. And our view was, the considered view, I think, of the leadership was, Let's do this, we have to do it, because it's the best and only chance we might ever get to get an agreement. One of the things that became evident to me as we went around the room and each of us listed the issues, that there wasn't a commitment uh, on the part of the Republican movement of Sinn Féin and the IRA to decommission their weapons. Sinn Féin were simply committing to use their best efforts. Uh, and frankly, given our past experience, uh, that simply wasn't good enough. At this stage, the other delegations were getting restless and we took a vote. Uh, the result of that vote was actually quite narrow. I think the gap was only two votes, so the UUP, by a split vote of those officers present, decided to that they would endorse the agreement and I was one of the negotiators who voted against endorsing the agreement. A few minutes before 5 p.m., I was told that David Trimble was on the line. I said, hello, David, how are you doing? And I'll never forget his words. He said, we're ready to do the business. I said, well, that's great, thank you. I said, uh, I'd like to call a meeting right away at 5 p.m., can you be there? He said, yes. At that point, David asked me if I would join him uh, at the plenary session. I said, look, David, I, I simply can't do that. At that stage, myself and Arlene Foster was also a member of the negotiating team. We left Castle Buildings. In essence, the decision we took uh, was that we couldn't uh, join the plenary to endorse an agreement that we felt was deeply flawed. It was that period throughout the afternoon and everything went quiet. And we got very little heads up as to what was happening. I think 10, 15 minutes uh, before we realized that the deal was actually going to be signed. I remember looking up at the monitor and there it was happening in front of my eyes. As majority leader of the United States Senate for six years before that, I'd learned many lessons. One of them is when you get the votes, you should vote. The deadline was finally here. It was then or never. And even when we walked into that room, you weren't entirely certain what was going to happen. If this agreement is approved in referendums north and south, 
It offers the chance for a better future. It will take the good faith efforts of the leaders gathered here and the commitment of all the people of Northern Ireland. He was eloquent, of course, as always, as George is. It wasn't a time for speeches. Nobody said very much. He just went around the table and he said, this is the, the document, say yes or no to agreement. The fact was here we were going to reach an agreement. It just filled you with uh, a sense of uh, achievement, uh, a sense of, uh, uh, of hope. I was the third party because we were seated alphabetically and we had to make it round to the eighth party, which was David Trimble's party, to find out if he was going to say yes. He nodded his head and said yes, and that was it. I have that bittersweet feeling that comes in life. I'm dying to leave, <laughs> but I hate to go. <laughs> At the end of the session, tears of joy and relief after divisions. In the I remember just pinching my leg because I thought it was a bit surreal. I think the feeling certainly was one of, oh my goodness, what have we just done? This is going to be life-changing for people. This is really going to change our society going forward. And that feeling of, of just, it was nearly euphoric. These negotiations and the new arrangements which result from them are part of our collective journey from the failures of the past towards a future together as equals. It was an extraordinary atmosphere. People were exultant, they were exhausted. I remember there were hugs for everybody from Mo Molum, and they were all heading for the exit. Uh, Tony Blair uh, heading off on holidays, Bertie Hearn heading back down to Dublin to mourn his mother. Fundamental to resolving this problem is agreement. And agreement threatens no section of our people, but challenges both sections of our people and their public representatives in particular to come forward with new thinking. I said when I arrived here on Wednesday night that I felt the hand of history upon us. Today I hope that the burden of history can at long last start to be lifted from our shoulders. It will take more of the courage we have shown, but it need not mean more of the pain. And today is about the promise of a bright future, a day when we hope a line can be drawn under the bloody past. We must all seize the opportunity. Ahead of us stretches the prospect of a radical transformation of all the key relationships and these islands. After a 30-year winter of sectarian violence, Northern Ireland today has the promise of a springtime of peace. That was the green light for us. We put together an office on the Saturday morning trying to set up a campaign uh, within hours of the uh, agreement news coming through and that sense of relief and excitement that this was a potential turning point. And back in Belfast, the Yes campaign launched its billboards. The slogan, vote yes, it's the way ahead. All sides are now gearing up to drive home their message in earnest. The people out there know that their vote will be the most historic vote in their lives. We want to bring a new life for our young people, for my children and for my grandchildren. We said six weeks isn't long and we've got to get around this country to, to get people to say yes and yes. It's going to be complicated because a peace agreement is complicated, whereas no is one word. The women of Northern Ireland did write themselves into the history. They were the ones who formed the alliance. They were the ones who ran uh, on a party platform to be part of making peace. They're the ones who kept showing up even when they were treated disrespectfully. Um, so they did write themselves into history and they showed that women were not victims of history, uh, they could be change makers. They could actually make a difference for themselves, their families and communities. The Women's Coalition began their campaign in support of the agreement. We hired a double-decker bus and we took our kids on it and we drove around villages and towns and stood on street corners with loudspeakers, knocked doors, walked our shoes till the leather came off them, explaining, explaining, explaining why people needed to say yes. 
I think the, the PUP are probably very brave in what they're doing. I don't mean by just coming to Bahamut. I mean, they're very brave. I think they're very brave to say we're taking a stand on this and we're going all the way through with it. We were encouraging people to uh, register to vote. We were holding clinics in our constituency offices where people could come in and fill in a form and, and get registered to vote. And the uptake was, was more than, than what there would ever have been during an ordinary election. So we were really encouraged that people who hadn't previously voted in their lives were actually coming out and getting registered to vote for, for the referendum. Yes for peace, yes for hope, yes for equality. There is a great buoyant feeling um, amongst the membership that here we were um, taking part in something and advocating something that would have real historic importance. We realised uh, when we threw that big banner down the front of the Europa Hotel, there was a different feeling that this was the moment the people were deciding we're going to vote yes. We did a huge amount of work. Like, I mean, there, were, there was a leadership team continuously on the road and the party met at all different levels. I was a bit daunted. George Mitchell had said something which was really, really true. He said, now you have the hard bit. I would urge everybody who is physically able to make it in their duty to come out and vote on that day. I was very worried that David Trimble wasn't going to actively canvas to the way that I thought he would. I mean, I did a tour of Ireland for 17 days at a huge public meetings. David took a different view in the North. He didn't do that. Mark McGuinness's famous words that no document ever in the history of Northern Ireland was read so much as the Good Friday Agreement. You know, so that was good. And I, I think there, there was no doubt then about the Republican nationalist vote. But there was a lot of concern about would we have the majority of unions. I've read the agreement and all it says is about terrorists getting out onto our streets. No decommissioning taking place. Where does it say? Wait a minute. It does say that You were trying to have an informed debate and an informed discussion with people. But a lot of the time, they weren't actually talking about the detail of what was in the agreement. They were talking about what they thought was in it or what somebody had told them was in it. And most of the time, that wasn't right. As the referendum process moved forward, the intensity heightened and heightened. Paisley and his anti-agreement supporters zeroed in on prisoners zeroed in on decommissioning and the reform of policing. And the problem for us was we didn't really have an answer for that. It's very difficult whenever you have someone like Ian Paisley, who had such a long track record of being a strong voice for unionism, and therefore a lot of people trusted what he said. That is the yes campaign, a campaign of misleading, lies, deceit, and we've heard it over and over again. I'm reading the document, and you know perfectly well that at the end of 24 months, every terrorist will be on the streets. Paisley was straight out um, slamming and condemning the Good Friday Agreement as a sellout and those involved in negotiating as traitors. I was stopped by former prisoners in the street saying, what about these prisoner releases? And I'm going, well, you're a former prisoner. You know, loyalist prisoners are being released as well. Uh, but that might be OK, but I don't want IRA prisoners out. You know, there was like a rule for one and a rule for a different rule for others. And I think it's uh, very clear, certainly anybody who has actually been on the ground will know that overwhelmingly the unionist community is voting against this deal, and so they should. The DUP and other anti-agreement campaigners were very active, very effective. Doing everything they could in order to turn as many units as possible against the agreement. It wasn't nationalism, which was the, the, the problem in terms of a referendum, it was unionism. David Trimble was very half-hearted in the way he sold the agreement he had worked so hard to achieve. Now, he says, of course, he was hampered by the appearance of uh, IRA prisoners, the so-called Balcom Street gang, at the Sinn Féin Ardèche in Dublin during the referendum campaign, which um, was quite a moment. Jerry Adams, of course, has to convince his party membership that they need to change their policy to say no return to Stormont 
uh, 180, yes, we are actually going to storm it now. We support this agreement. I looked at that that day on the news. I was watching the news. Oh, my God. And I couldn't believe these people had been let out for this event. But then I looked at it again. I thought, that's clever. That's very, very clever because you're totally distracting your own rank and file Republicans from looking at anything that's inside the agreement to just looking at these prisoners who have just been let out of jail. These are our heroes, as he was presenting them. And it worked. Welcome home, comrades. It probably was bigger than we thought. If they hadn't have been there, the Ardash probably would have taken the decision that it took anyway, so it, 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 their presence was, was more of a morale boost. We said there could be no political settlement and no peace settlement until all of the prisoners are free. And we mean and we meant that. Right away and quite quickly, people were able to see that these sort of mysterious figures like they'd been locked up for a considerable uh, time. And there they were. You had to show that the bloody thing worked. It, People who might have had doubts about it would be reassured. This is, you know, still only you know, months after the I read murdered police officers in Lurgan, County Armagh, uh, exploded a bomb in Market Hill in County Armagh. You know, these things were still raw. And then to parade people who had been involved in acts of terrorism, um, uh, I think will have persuaded some unionists at that time on balance to vote against the agreement in the referendum. And I still believe to this day uh, that a narrow majority of unionists actually voted no in the referendum. It wasn't just a mistake to let them go, but then for, the, for the Sinn Féin to think it was a good idea to have them come to the Ardesh and punch the air as victors. I mean, you could see the numbers moving on the polls just as a result of that. Uh, and no, that was, that was just a catastrophic mistake. It was quite surreal, with a, a degree of cynicism. Does a leopard change its spots? But at the same time, uh, it's a dose of reality. It was actually seeing the evidence that this is, this is happening and government uh, and political parties are agreeing to it. What is the impact going to be for police officers if you have a sudden release of people who are murderers, uh, explosive experts, snipers, intelligence gatherers? What threat will that be to society? How will we have to respond to it? Um, of course, thankfully, uh, we didn't have a full-scale return. Many of those ex-prisoners did go on to do uh, good work on in issues like restorative justice and community development. But yes, at the time, it was both surreal and, as, as I say, something, something I felt uh, cynical about. It was our call on early release. Sinn Féin had to get this passed. It was my decision. If these guys did go to the Ardesh, it would be seen as, as progress. I was always thought if it was something was worth fighting for, then you had to make tough decisions. And uh, that was a tough decision. I have to say that the biggest challenge we faced during the campaign was created by Mo Molum when she allowed people to come out of prison come to the Ulster Hall to big rallies and various other things. I mean, she probably cost us, I reckon, about 5% on the referendum. She didn't have to do that. It was not necessary. This has been beamed out live on Sky News around the world. And I'm sitting in Glengall Street in the Unionist Party headquarters, literally with my head in my hands, just thinking, how on earth do you explain this away? I can't now see an easy way forward. But of course, I'm not going to shirk my responsibilities if that's what happens. Mo Molum's worries are understandable, given that the No campaign is landing a fresh blow virtually daily. Mo Molum thought that releasing Michael Stone from the UDA from prison a week later would equalise it. But of course it didn't, because for the uh, unionist community, that was uh, letting the lunatics take over the asylum. So at that stage, the polling that the uh, Northern Ireland office were doing plummeted. Uh, and was uh, down to 37% at one stage for a yes vote. So we knew we had a lot of work to do. We have a choice about being together in the future or being about apart in the future. It is about that whatever their personal and political disagreements, there is more that they can agree about. 
With a poll today showing many of the North's young people still undecided how to vote, the world's biggest rock group will be joining the effort to persuade them to back the agreement. Ian Paisley was on the radio giving it hellfire and damnation. Well, I think it is quite evident that Mr. Trimble has joined the pan-nationalist front and he's now going to rock and roll. He's rocking anyway, and he'll be rolling after the 22nd. And I remember thinking at the time, you know, <laughs> that's not good for us, that's not good for us. And then I just thought, no, no, he knows this is a PR masterstroke. He actually, he gets it, and he knows this is going to completely refocus the media and campaign agenda for the final week, and there's nothing he can do about it. We knew with this press conference with Ash, I feared the worst. I, I thought he's, he could make a complete idiot of himself and all of us, and the event, and of course, uh, the exact opposite happened. Uh, we know that this assembly is only going to succeed uh, if John and myself, or to be more precise, the Ulster Unionist Party and the SDLP can provide the centre of gravity for it. So that is the key image and issue we want to leave with people. He started talking about um, wanting to make Belfast a better city for his kids growing up. Everything brightened up. We were just on this momentum then to the show itself. When people go to vote on Friday, they're voting for their children, their grandchildren, and for future generations, because they're voting to lay the foundations of lasting stability and lasting peace. When Bono was talking to them backstage and he was saying, you know, this is what I want to do, I'm going to ask you something that, you know, you're not used to doing or you've never done before. And I could see David, David was already nervous, and I could see him looking at him going, he's not going to ask me to sing, is he? You know? <laughs> and, and, you know, instantly he said, I'm just going to ask, you know, say nothing. And you could just see to him, so just drop, thank God for that, you know? I would like to introduce you to two men who are making history. Two men who have taken a leap of faith out of the past and into the future. People were weary that we were coming to a new millennium and that psyche was working on people and we were convinced that people wanted change. I'm just glad people can get a chance now to try and have peace and live together and cut out the bike a train, just get on with their lives. We were absolutely sure that people would vote for it and of course uh, we wanted the highest vote but we couldn't be sure what, what that percentage would be. The importance was not lost on the politicians, with party leaders among the first at the polling stations this morning. Try to say no. I mean, there was generally speaking a feeling of catharsis after Good Friday itself. There was a sense that we had, against all the odds, pulled off this agreement and the campaigns went well, I think, in both jurisdictions. The overwhelming yes vote averaged 94.7%. At the end of the day, I think the result in the, in the South was uh, on the scale we had hoped for. One count assistant said that by noon she had yet to see a no ballot paper and in Dublin North East there were four boxes containing not a single no vote. It was difficult to uh, explain uh, to uh, an audience in the South uh, why people would vote against the Good Friday Agreement in a referendum, uh, because it had been seen in such a positive light by everybody in, uh, in the Republic. Majority of votes in favour of the proposal, 1,356,835. I remember feeling that the result would probably be a yes, but I couldn't really predict what the margin would be. The time of reckoning has come for Northern Ireland, and all the indications are that today will mark the beginning of a new political era. We came up to the day of the poll really, really nervous. We did not know, really did not know, if the no side, the anti-agreement side, were going to win the day on the unionist side. The turnout is estimated to be a massive 80 to 81 percent. On the day of the kind that was at the King's Hall, yeah, it was all a bit you know, chaotic. Looking forward to see what the result would be.
news organizations from all over the world, scrambling for the interviews and beaming their reports back via satellite to all four corners of the globe. It was about getting enough support in order to allow people to say, you know, let's give it a chance. The agreement wasn't the end. The referendum wasn't the end. It was just the next step. It was very positive at the Count Centre in the King's Hall from the very start. As soon as the boxes started to empty and they were doing the verification, and that's where the expert tally people from the parties could tell, and they were saying, yeah, it's looking good. We saw the boxes pouring out, and we immediately started monitoring the boxes from the unionist districts, and we could see they were much higher on the yes side. Just seeing that the yes vote was coming through in boxes that were majority unionist boxes, in some cases just edging it, that all gave a real sense of confidence. I arrived at the Count in the King's Hall, and as the DUP entourage arrived, I think they knew the game was up at that point. We felt we'd done enough. Those campaigning for the agreement said a 70% endorsement was really needed to make it work. Eventually, when the electoral officer pulled people together, the roar could be heard, and up it went. At the referendum, was as follows. Yes, 71.12%. The politicians involved in two and a half years of negotiations were overjoyed. They knew Northern Ireland was finally entering a new political era. Pandemonium broke loose with the excitement of, uh, of those who'd worked for a yes campaign and had secured a yes vote and were building a better future. I received notification that first that the referendums had been approved and I was pretty certain that was going to happen. The only surprise was the size of the vote of approval. I certainly remember thinking that's some result. Perhaps I was expecting it to be closer, but as it turned out, it was a, a huge uh, endorsement of, uh, of the Good Friday Agreement and of the negotiations and of the way forward. This is a majority of both communities. That, to me, is a pretty strong base to build on. We would have been satisfied with anything over 50% of unionism. Less than 50% would have been a real problem. Uh, we got substantially more than that, so that was, that was good. I think people voted with their hearts. Uh, and therefore I'm not surprised. It, I think the outcome reflected a huge desire across all of society in Northern Ireland to put the troubles behind us. Um, and people were less worried about the detail than, than the emotional um, decision that they were making to um, support an agreement that they felt held out the potential to create peace. As we all know, this is a, an extraordinary moment of history. And now, of course, the people had spoken. And now this is the Good Friday Agreement. It's now the will of the people of the island of Ireland. 71.12%. I think when you stand back from it, there's been very few agreements of this nature that have received such a mandate. And I believe that mandate was uh, legitimized what we were trying to do. And it differed from other things because we had public approval for what we were doing. The no campaigners, including Ian Paisley and Bob McCartney, were taunted by loyalists. So as the vote finished and as everybody was preparing to leave, Ian Paisley was surrounded by a lot of the loyalists. And they started singing, cheerio, cheerio, cheerio. This is just, this is just the first blow. And I was thinking down this, and I, I genuinely was thinking to myself, is that the end of Ian Paisley? We got the majority. We got the majority of Kitchener's I'd like to think it is, but I don't think it is. <laughs> John Hume and David Trimble in Oslo tonight enjoying the post-award ceremonial at a traditional torchlight procession outside their city centre hotel. Nobody believed that Good Friday was going to be the end of everything that ever happened in Ireland, but hopefully it was going to be the end of violence forevermore. Having said that, in my view, there is no point in having a referendum uh, until all the issues are pre-worked out 
and that you're putting to the people uh, a set uh, of decisions where it is clear to them they know what the future will look like in a new Ireland. So when that work is done and you put it to the people, uh, that's the day you do it. There are opposing dreams on this island which cannot be ignored, cannot be wished away, cannot be silenced, nor should they be. Those approaches failed in the past and they will fail in the future. Our own long history has taught us that a dream imposed by force is no dream at all. We need to frame the question of a debate on constitutional change in ways that is actually faithful to the language of the agreement. The Good Friday Agreement, it isn't just some ornament to be treasured, it is machinery that needs to be worked so that that referendum on the constitutional status can take place without presumption, without prejudice and without predicament. It's what the people voted for 25 years ago and there's still a very clear demand. 71.12%. The commitments in the peace agreement, key elements of it unimplemented and contested. I mean, there is no point contesting equality of opportunity, human rights, um, justice, issues of dealing with the past. Um, all of those, I think, are essential elements in, in what builds peace in the future. And it's, it's sad to see that those are the contested elements. Not good enough. That has to change. When you compare what happened before the Good Friday Agreement, what happened afterwards, there are a whole generation of young people coming up and, and living in peace. This is the probably the only sustained peace process that succeeded of a major conflict in the last half century. And it was never going to be done with anything other than a, you know, some subtlety and, and guile alongside the, 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 the you know, the, the very good end which we wanted, which is a peaceful future for Northern Ireland. That makes, in a way, the Irish Peace Agreement even more of a miracle. There, there were people on all sides of that who wanted their children to grow up with normal lives. People on all sides of that who were willing to trust the next generation and the generation beyond with the power of decision making, with the moral compass to make compromises. I mean, it was, a, it was an enormous act of trust, but they trusted in a framework that I think should be able to work nearly anywhere if more people would accept it on the front end. The agreement is a staging post on our journey to peace and stability. One has to recognize that the agreement, from a unionist point of view, uh, underpinned the principle of consent. Uh, it, um, uh, in that sense, provided a safeguard for our place within the United Kingdom. You know, the agreement has been a catalyst for a lot of good things equally um, it, it's only been part of a longer journey, which we're still on. I think it's a very exciting time, change of the type of potential that's coming up that the union could end if the people decided. Of course, there'll be detractors and of course, there'll be bigots, but the rest of us will get on with our lives and enjoy it and, 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 and make this a fit and place for everyone. People ask me, what is the most gratifying thing about my many years in Northern Ireland? And it's in the numbers. In the 25 years preceding the agreement, 3,500 people in Northern Ireland were killed, and an estimated 50,000 were injured. In all the years since the agreement, the total number of violent deaths, it's about 145.